Frank, fancy seeing you here. Hey, you gotta help me out. The gym closed. The one bar closed. My favorite cupcake factory closed. Yeah, this place was the spot after a long day at high school. I remember it. Are you okay though? You seem depressed. What are we gonna do? A depression? Do you have the cure? You know, there's a chance that watching this video with Will and Clark could cure you. Cue it up. We're back with part two of Unit 12 in AP Psychology. We're gonna continue our conversation on psychological disorders to understand how they affect people. In this section, we're gonna talk about three disorders first, formerly called mood disorders, in which depression is the common factor. Let's start with major depressive disorder, which is a state of hopelessness and lethargy, or lack of energy, that lasts for several weeks or even months. Persistent depressive disorder is similar, but the symptoms are much milder, and they last for longer periods of time, hence the name persistent. You can remember to distinguish the two by remembering that major is great, overwhelming, and large, and then persistent is continuous and over longer periods of time. Next, let's talk about bipolar disorder. It's when a person alternates between the hopelessness and lethargy of depression and the overexcited, hyperactive state of mania. This can be described as similar to being on a roller coaster. One week, people can be on extreme, optimistic highs with poor judgment and recklessness and suddenly be plunged into terrible lows and depression the next. But let's dive deeper into major depressive disorder. This type of depression is extremely serious and can affect an individual's sleep, thinking, appetite, energy levels, and even their interest in activities they used to love. These are called cognitive behavioral changes, which means that depression changes the way that you think and even act. People get depression from environmental stressors, such as a crumbling marriage, difficult home life, or a traumatic experience. Women are also almost twice as likely to be diagnosed with MDD than men, which is a phenomenon seen worldwide. Recently, teenagers are becoming more susceptible, with the highest rates of MDD being among young adults in developed countries. Depression is a whole body disorder, and genes actually have a large impact on whether or not you receive the disorder. Depression and bipolar disorder can actually run in families, and it is passed down through genes. Some other disorders you should be aware of are somatic symptom disorder, which is when a somatic or bodily symptom is present, but it can't be physiologically explained. So it's basically where you feel super sick, but there actually is no real sickness affecting you. And then we have conversion disorder, which is when anxiety appears to have been converted into a physical symptom that is no reasonable neurological or medical basis. It can't be explained by science. And then we have illness anxiety disorder, which is, involves the interpretation of normal sensations as a dreaded disorder. In other words, a hypochondriac. Say you feel a little bump on your forehead, hypochondriacs may think that they immediately have a brain tumor. Frank, come here, come here, come here. What's wrong, Abe? Feel this on my head, right here, this spot. Uh, okay. You feel that? Uh, not There's a really, bump. bro. There's a bump. I definitely have brain cancer. Now let's move on to the depressed brain. Now, when the brain is depressed, brain activity diminishes or decreases. In contrast, brain activity increases during a phenomenon known as mania that we talked about earlier. Now, moving back to depression, though, when we examine the physical brain during depression, we notice that the left frontal lobe of the brain, otherwise known as the reward center, is less active. Typically, when we think of happiness in terms of the brain, we think of a chemical known as dopamine. But dopamine isn't the only chemical that is related to mood boosts. Norepinephrine is another neurotransmitter that results in happiness. When depression takes over the brain, this chemical greatly decreases in amount, making mood boosts very rare. Moving on, let's discuss how physical objects and activities can cause MDD, which stands for Major Depressive Disorder, known by some as clinical depression. A prime example of this is smoking. Smoking is known to increase the risk of MDD. Again, that's major depressive disorder. Like smoking, alcohol can also increase the risk of clinical depression. But here's a question. What exactly is the relationship between alcohol and depression? Because at first, it may seem counterintuitive. If someone were depressed, they might drink alcohol to feel better. 
But here's the problem. When people drink alcohol, they have a large chance of getting addicted and subsequently different facets of their life start to suffer. For example, they might lose their spouse, their job, and dig themselves in a financial hole impossible to escape out of. In turn, their depression worsens. So the bottom line here is drinking will not help you solve depression. Next, let's delve into the notion of non-suicidal self-injury. Otherwise known as NSSI, this notion refers to when an individual harms his or herself without the intention of suicide. When we're thinking about examples of this, things like cutting, burning, or hitting hard objects come to mind. But if we're thinking about NSSI in reference to the big picture, we can often see that NSSI is a co-symptom with depression and anxiety, meaning NSSI happens along with depression and or can occur because of it. Next, let's talk about schizophrenia and its causes. Now, schizophrenia is a fairly complex idea slash disorder. It refers to a group of disorders that can distort reality, cause people to have delusions and or inappropriate actions and emotions. So in order to fully understand schizophrenia, we're going to go through the different facets. So let's understand the symptoms by studying their names and meanings. First, we have hallucinations, a term used to describe false sensory experiences. The most common example is seeing something that doesn't actually exist. The second system is symptom is delusions. This can take shape in many form, forms. For example, someone might be under the delusion that someone is out to get them or that someone is trying to hurt them. This is known as delusion of persecution. Another delusion type is delusion of grandeur, which happens when someone is under the false notion that they are very important. For example, they might believe that they are wealthy, powerful in the realm of politics, or even powerful in the sense of historical context. Maybe they believe that they are a king or a queen of some sort. The next category of symptoms are those that are in plain sight and are easily observed. Let's start this category off with disorganized speech, which is exactly what you think it is. Schizophrenic ind individuals who exhibit this trait often jumble their words and struggle to speak proper, coherent sentences. Next, there is disorganized thinking, which isn't as obvious, but it can often be seen through the things people say. Disorganized thinking is the inability to form proper coherent thoughts. Again, a very straightforward term. But why does schizophrenia happen? Well, the answer is simple. It depends. It could be genetics. It could be brain changes or chemical changes, often caused by various drugs. But it could be other things like pregnancy compilation, complications or childhood trauma. But next, let's talk about some more niche disorders, starting off with dissociative disorders. These are extremely controversial, rare disorders in which a person's conscious awareness actually separates from painful memories, thoughts, and feelings. Their brain alters their own reality and can make them forget traumatic events in their lives or even change one's identity. A very rare form of these dissociative diseases that Hollywood has since popularized is called dissociative identity disorder or multiple personality disorder in which two or more distinct personalities, each with its own voice and mannerisms, seem to control a person's behavior at different times. Skeptics note that DID increased dramatically in the late 20th century that is rarely found outside of America and that it may reflect role-playing by people who are vulnerable to therapists' suggestions. DID could also be explained as a manifestation of feelings of anxiety or as a coping mechanism for trauma. Basically, scientists aren't really sure how real this disorder is. But next, let's talk about personality disorders, which are disruptive, inflexible, and enduring patterns of behavior that impair one's social interaction and are actually quite common. The 10 disorders in DSM-5 tend to form three clusters characterized by anxiety, eccentric or odd behaviors, and dramatic or impulsive behaviors. One of the most common is called antisocial personality disorder. It's a personality disorder in which a person, usually a man, exhibits a lack of conscience for wrongdoing, even towards friends and family members. They may be aggressive and ruthless, and they're also known as sociopaths or psychopaths. And while people with antisocial personality disorders may exhibit traits perfect for a life of crime, many actually turn out to be extremely successful CEOs, athletes, and even surgeons. Essentially, they're more laser-focused, fearless, and dominant, but aren't able to make intimate connections with other people. A key distinction is right here, so make sure you know the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath. And next, let's talk about eating disorders. 
Anorexia nervosa, or anorexia for short, is an eating disorder in which a person, usually an adolescent female, maintains a starvation diet despite being significantly underweight. Despite this, they feel fat, fear being fat, and convince themselves that they're still overweight. They often diet and exercise ex obsessively to maintain a really skinny appearance. Bulimia nervosa, or bulimia, is when a person will enter a binge, purge, depression cycle, which is where you overeat and binge on food, and then purge all of it out by vomiting, laxative use, fasting, or excessive exercise, and then following these episodes, individuals enter a state of depression about their body image. And then finally, we have binge eating disorder, which is when you eat significantly and then enter a state of remorse. As you can see, it's kind of a spectrum between eating nothing and then eating everything. Frank has unfortunately been feeling pretty down lately, so I decided to invite him for a run and see if I can make him feel better. What's that? Frank, what's up? What are How are you, you doing? Guy? How's it going? You ready for our fishing trip, dude? Yeah, are you are you on a new medication or something? Oh like yeah. This guy, Dr. McLovin, found him on Craigslist. Hook me up with your best powdered antidepressant on the market. Okay. You ready for our fishing trip or what? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's go then. The fish are gonna get cold. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. And we'll catch you guys next time.